So the webinar today will be covering uh, trial plot analysis, specifically uh, multispectral mapping um, for this kind of, of research. And I'm excited to be joined by Salvi uh, and the Danish Technological Institute today to speak through from hardware, software to end user experience um, and, and you know, experience in, in the field from implementing this technology. So to give a little background on this, um, this, uh, how we've come together for this collaborative uh, webinar. MicaSense is focused on the multispectral hardware. Solvi is providing the data processing and analytics capability um, to fully utilize and get the most information out of that multispectral data. Um, and then the Danish Technological Institute is implementing this across a variety of, of trial plot um, in research trials um, and has some great insights to share. So excited to dive in today. We've got lots of great information. Um, so just a brief introduction from all the speakers today. Um, I'm joined by Igor, CEO and founder of Solvi, and Tomas, product manager at uh, Danish Technological Institute. So we'll each give a brief introduction of ourselves. Um, I'll start off. I'm Emily Shashelsky, Director of Global Channel Sales at Microsense. Um, so since we are focused on the hardware, we keep things open to third-party options for both uh, the drone solution, the drone platform, and the software and the analytics. Um, so I work with our, our global reseller network that's bringing those full solutions to customers and advising them on that. And I will pass it off to Igor for a brief introduction of him as well. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Igor Tihonov, and I'm uh, the CEO and founder of Solvi. Uh, I'll share our brief story uh, a bit later, but um, uh, today I'm working mainly with uh, the product development and marketing and sales initiatives. And uh, Solvi, for those who don't know, is the cloud-based uh, software for drone imagery processing and then also the analytics with specific uh, focus on agriculture. <clears throat> yes. My name is Thomas Nitzke. I'm working in a, a, a Danish Technological Institute, uh, primarily with the drones, but also uh, robots and uh, precision agriculture. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you both for joining us today. Really excited to be going through. So a brief overview for everyone on what we'll be covering today. I'll start off with a brief introduction on the MicaSense sensor suite because we do have some new sensors that have been released. Um, and then I'll give the majority of the time for Igor to go through Solvi, provide a live demonstration of both the multispectral processing workflow uh, as well as the trial plot creation tools and example outputs um, that you can uh, you can get from the Solvi platform. And then. Tomas will close us out with some information on, on Denmark's National Field Trials Program, um, some of the work that they've been doing with this kind of drone mapping, and some lesson learned. So at the end, we will, we've got a lot of information to go through, so we may not have time to get through all the questions, um, but if we're not able to get to it, we'll, we'll follow up via email, but we'll go through that at the very end. So a brief introduction on MicaSense. Um, we are an Ag Eagle company. Um, we are part of the larger Ag Eagle group now that is includes two other brands with Measure for um, flight management services and SenseFly for fixed wing drone hardware. So MicaSense is focused on the payload, specifically multispectral sensors. We have a thermal one as well, but it's all geared towards vegetation management. So that can be from research like this trial pod analysis work that we're mentioning with with plant breeders and, and universities that are doing that um, to foresters, land managers, um, production agriculture as well. Um, so a variety of applications that our sensors are utilized for. Our latest sensor suite, we recently came out with uh, the Red Edge P on the left and the Alton PT on the right. So both have utilized a panchromatic sensor, which allows us to get a higher space resolution. Um, so when designing these new sensors, you know, we're always keeping in mind that these are going to be flown on drones. So we always have to keep the footprint of the camera as small as possible, keep the weight down, um, be cognizant of the even the, the file sizes that you're getting from, um, from all of your images. Um, and so what we've, we've done here with the latest Red Edge P and the Ultim PT 
is we've been able to achieve double the spatial resolution of previous models utilizing that panchromatic band while keeping that camera size um, to a reasonable, reasonable footprint. Um, our sensors are also utilizing now CF Express storage cards, which have a much faster write speed. So also important for drone mapping to be able to have the camera trigger quite quickly if you wanna fly faster, whether it's because you're covering large areas with a fixed wing or because you're doing uh, trial plot research and you wanna fly low and be able to still cover the area in a reasonable amount of time. So our sensors are used all across the globe in over 75 countries and featured in a variety of research publications. Um, for this kind of multispectral mapping, it's very important to do radiometric calibration so you can compare your data over time. That's very important to us and we provide a light sensor and a calibration panel with each of our sensor kits for that purpose. So Igor will, will speak to that a little bit when it comes to the processing workflow of how that information is utilized. Um, but it's it's essential to be able to calibrate the data and compare it from, from flight to flight across the season. And then additionally, all of this data is geotagged so that you can stitch it together um, in post-processing, create that map that you need to, to generate analytics. Um, we have a standard GPS that's embedded in the light sensor, but we also have options for more precision geotagging, specifically with the DJI Matrice 300 that's displayed here. We have a DJI Skyport integration that allows um, not only for the drone to command the camera for that deeper integration, but also to utilize the RTK um, precision geotagging for the imagery. And then also very important to us to keep the outputs from the sensor open. Um, we even have a GitHub tutorial for those that really wanna dive into the metadata. And we work with partners like Solvi that are um, providing a robust processing and analytics workflow to really get the most use out of this imagery. So I wanted to share a, a new data set that we have. We recently flew this one with our Red Edge P sensor. So this is a blueberry field uh, near us in Washington. We were able to fly it at two different altitudes. So just to show you visually what the, you know, double the spatial resolution over the previous models, what that looks like. So on the, the upper two images there, um, you can see the flight at 120 meters. So on the left-hand side is the output from the multispectral, and on the right-hand side is the multispectral once it's pan sharpened. So that panchromatic band that I mentioned has a much higher resolution than the multispectral. We use it to um, essentially pan sharpen to that higher resolution. It's a method that's been used in satellite imagery for, for a while, so now we're bringing it to the drone level. And the same benefits apply there. We're able to um, have a, a smaller camera, but that's still able to deliver that higher spatial resolution that customers want, um, while also being uh, having better management of file size as well um, through this method. On the bottom two images, we have the 60 meter flight. So at half that, that altitude, you're able to get two centimeters per pixel from that output. So in the pan sharpened on the bottom right hand corner, you can even start to see some of the blossoms on, on those blueberry bushes. This is that same field, but flown with the Alton PT. So you can see the, the outputs for this as well. At 120 meters, the pan sharpened output is gonna be 2.5 centimeters per pixel. If you fly lower at 60 meters, that will be 1.2 centimeters per pixel. Um, so if you fly even lower for, you know, to get the maximum amount of, of resolution, you can even get to the millimeter level resolution. Um, so especially relevant for the, the trial plot research we're, we're discussing here. Um, one of the main advantages of this high resolution is enabling more machine learning tasks. So again, uh, Igor will speak to that and Tomas as well for some of the work that they've done um, for automating things like plant counting, uh, looking at early emergence rates, really important to um, have as much resolution as possible for those kind of tasks. As well as with this Ultim sensor, you can get the thermal reading. So I'll, I'll show that next. The thermal output here, um, we have increased the resolution over our previous model. We used to use a FLIR lepton, now we use a FLIR boson. So we're able to get much higher resolution to assess canopy temperature for each plant um, for assessing water stress, um, especially important for trials that are looking at drought tolerance um, or irrigation trials. So this is the same blueberry field, but the entire field view here that we see uh, so it's flown at 60 meters and you can see what the resolution looks like there at 
17 centimeters per pixel for the thermal. And these data sets will be available on our website soon. So you can really zoom in and, and get to see um, you know, the full capability of the resolution there. But I'll, I'll leave it here, zooming into um, a couple of this particular portion of the field to just show these outputs um, from this one sensor. Um, the idea is to get the maximum amount of data possible. And so we're able to get both a high resolution RGB composite on the left, the vegetation health information with, in this case, NDVI utilizing the multispectral bands, um, and then the thermal output as well. So it's all synchronized. There's no headache trying to align all of these uh, in post-processing from different sensors. It all comes in one package. So that's a really big benefit of the, the Ultim line specifically. Um, but when it comes to you know, the, the full capability of the analytics for the multispectral, I'll, I'll pass it off to, to Igor next to go over the um, processing workflow, what that looks like once you've actually flown and captured the data, as well as the variety of different analytics that are available. <clears throat> okay, uh, can I just confirm Emily, that my screen is visible? <clears throat> yes, you're all set. Awesome. So first, I would like to share a bit of background about Solvi. So as I mentioned, we uh, are a cloud-based service for drone imagery processing and analytics. And uh, I started the company back in 2015, so in the very early ages of the drone technology. Uh, and I started as a, a pilot project with uh, the Swedish University of Agriculture, uh, SLU in Swedish, uh, who has been really early adopters of the drone technology and has been using, uh, using it since 2005, I think. Uh, and we looked into how to make it really easy and straightforward to turn the drone images over the maps over the whole field uh, and then extract available information from it. <clears throat> so the pilot project was the desktop software that would process the imagery locally, but we quickly realized that you, know, you need the powerful hardware to do it in a in, in short amount of time. Uh, so that's why the uh, Solvi version that was released in 2017 became a cloud solution. So all the processing can happen in the cloud with powerful hardware and users can just easily access the data from everywhere and analyze it. <clears throat> And since 2017, we have been working closely with our customers from all over the world and uh, listening to the feedback and uh, develop the different tools. Uh, so plant counting is one of the uh, tools that is used very, very often. Uh, and the zonal statistics is another one uh, that I will focus uh, specifically on today. Uh, and uh, why use the uh, drone imagery in the field trials? And it's probably, like we have seen a you know, very uh, clear trend that in the recent one or two years, uh, specifically in the field trials, drone imagery is used more and more. Uh, and that is uh, not strange because uh, drone technology provides just such more, much more efficient way of assessing the progress and the results of the field trials uh, compared to the traditional method of assessments where uh, a researcher or the assistant would uh, assess uh, the plots out of the field manually making notes uh, and uh, some of these assessments would be uh, probably even uh, subjective and uh, limited to the data that was captured by that researcher uh, there and then. Uh, drone imagery on the other hand uh, provide much more objective way and can be used to map the fields uh, literally in a matter of minutes or half an hour hour if it's a larger trial. And then at the com uh, comfort of the office, the researchers can process the imagery and play around with different analytics and tools to extract a lot of uh, valuable information. Uh, but also uh, it serves as a good documentation moving forward. So as the new methods and algorithms and AI models are developed and uh, it becomes possible to extract even more data, it's really beneficial to having all this historical drone imagery over complete uh, field trials that you can go back to and do some additional analytics. Um, so I would like to go through the four main steps uh, from collecting the imagery uh, to processing it to extracting the plot boundaries and then finally the statistics and show some uh, real world examples from how our customers around the world use, use all these tools, uh, but also mention a few issues and pitfalls that are very common and how to avoid that. Um, so step number one is, of course, you need to collect the imagery and with sensors like Microsense multispectral cameras, uh, you 
collect uh, a lot of uh, detailed multispectral uh, data and with the new sensors that feature very high resolution it is really uh, can become a go-to sensors a sensor because you collect both visual uh, data RGB data and multispectral in, in one go uh, but there are a few things to consider when you're collecting the data so Microsense has a very good resource in their knowledge base and that's where the pictures are from uh, so I highly encourage to to look through it uh, but I will mention a few of, uh, of of the main points that are really important that we see our customers having sometimes issues with. Um, so first of all, it's the consistent high overlap is really crucial to uh, successful map stitching uh, because the map the images are um, put together into the maps uh, by matching the common objects uh, in the images. So it's really important that the overlap, both front and side overlap between the images is sufficient. Otherwise, you may see uh, different types of issues, so everything from the artifacts uh, like you see in the middle, uh, where you see these clear patches uh, that stand out there, uh, to like play and stitching issues where you can stitch them up because the overlap is insufficient and there is not enough details in the images to, to put them together. <clears throat> um, so the, the, the grid pattern that you see in the top left is the usual way of mapping the fields. Uh, but also in the process of the stitching, uh, it is possible to create the elevation models for the maps and then the high overlap is, uh, becomes especially important. But what you might want to consider also to fly the trials in the double grid pattern. So you fly first in one direction and then generate another grid and fly in another direction, just so that the crops are captured from the different angles and that usually helps to create much more accurate uh, elevation models and from that you can extract height, uh, height data uh, on the plot level. Um, so second uh, point is to avoid rolling cloud. This is really a very common issue uh, and the worst is when you go out uh, to fly and it's sunny and nice weather and then suddenly in the middle of the cloud, uh, flight the, the clouds come and they cover the sun uh, and that's kind of the artifacts that then you can see in the images. Uh, so you see the dark spots in the middle of the map and there's really nothing you can do about it so the, the, then the data is essentially uh, un, unuseful uh, in the analytics because they skew all the reflectance values and all the vegetation mix values that you calculate from that. Another issue that is, uh, can, can be common so it's, 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 it's the sun reflectance uh, so that sometimes can cause the problems in the stitching because uh, in the part of the image you will see a very strong reflection and some of the plants may not be visible. Uh, so, so when flying in the very strong sun uh, it's, it's, it's uh, ideal to try to avoid flying when the sun is right, right over uh, and uh, collecting the image when, when the sun is slightly uh, at the lower angle. And when it comes to the uh, to the date of time when it's uh, ideal to collect the imagery, it is within two and a half hours of the local solar noon, except from these cases when the sun is very strong. Uh, but otherwise, it's, it's advisable uh, not to fly at when the sun is very low because that can cast the shadows between the rows and also skew the reflectance and vegetation index values. Um, and then uh, last but not least, this is a very important thing, is to take the shots of the calibration panel uh, and that information is uh, later used during the process and to calibrate the imagery. So uh, if you, for example, fly one day uh, over the trial and the weather is sunny and another one it's cloudy or overcast, uh, you want to be able to still compare the data between the flights. Uh, so that's where the calibration panels uh, comes in. Uh, so we advise to take two or three shots uh, of the calibration panel, uh, like this is played in the image uh, before the flight and then also after the flight. Uh, and that's just to make sure that uh, you capture this variability in, in, in light conditions, but also if some of the captures are not successful, that you have some, some backup captures. Uh, if the flight is very long and you need to land the drone uh, and swap the batteries, it's usually a good idea to take uh, some shots of the calibration panel then as well. Um, so once the imagery is collected, the, the second step is to put them together into the map so you can uh, not only look at the individual images, but also uh, do the analytics on the whole field trial level. And uh, for that I will switch uh, over to Solvi and uh, walk through the different steps involved and what you need to consider here. Um, so here we, ha we see the, the uh, upload tool um, uh, where the multispectral imagery has been selected. Uh, and the first step is to validate that the data that you collected is, is correct. 
uh, that all the captures are complete and uh, also that you don't upload the data from some other location because if you have been out in the field flying multiple trials during the day you will have uh, multiple maps on the uh, memory card and it's really easy uh, really hard to actually figure out which images belong to which flight um, so in this way you can just uh, open the um, select all the images and uh, the locations of the captures will be displayed on the map so you can clearly see that they belong to the same trial uh, and Solver recognizes that this is Microsense data so it groups all the captures together so you can see that capture number one has five different bands because this it, it is Red Edge M uh, data set uh, but also you might want to consider things like, uh, for example, uh, the images that are selected here in the middle are were taken on the way from, from the last point of the flight to the starting point. And we have seen sometimes issues with these images because the drone might fly very fast to the, uh, back to the start point or when it takes off and, and flies to the, to the starting point of the flight. Uh, and that also can introduce some artifacts in the map, so, so they can be a very clear uh, uh, blurry patch uh, in the map so you want to avoid that and uh, with this kind of tool it's really easy to just select all the images here so these are one of the last images you just need to make sure that you don't remove the Im images with the reflectance panel um, and then you just uh, click remove and then uh, just like that it will be removed from the upload and all the images belonging to the actual flight will be uploaded um, another option to consider is the use of the DLS so the downloading uh, sunshine sensor which uh, during the flight records uh, the light conditions and uh, stores that metadata uh, in every image. Um, so this can be um, a nice addition to if the uh, flight conditions during the flight uh, vary a little, uh, then this data can be really beneficial in, into making the corrections in addition to reflectance panel. Uh, but the shots of the reflection panel uh, should always be taken, so that's uh, kind of the rule number one. So you always want to use the calibration panel, and then the DLS is the addition to that. Um, and then once you're, you're, you're done validating the imagery, you just hit upload, and then during the processing, uh, the reflectance panel will be identified automatically and used for calibration. And because the QR code in the latest panel contains all the reflectance information, uh, that will be also extracted automatically. Uh, and one last part you might want to consider during the uh, processing of the imagery is the accuracy of the map. So if you collect the imagery over the field trial uh, multiple times during the season and you want to overlay uh, the maps and all the data extracted from the map on top of each other, uh, then it really becomes important that the geographical accuracy of the, of the maps uh, uh, is, is accurate. Uh, so with standard GPS, there can be two or five meters uh, uh, error margin, which means that every time you stage the map, they will appear somewhat shifted uh, <clears throat> a little. Uh, and for that, you can use the either the RTK drone, uh, which records much more uh, accurate coordinates, uh, and they uh, are persisted in the imagery. Or you can use the ground control for, uh, ground control points, uh, which I can show in this example. Uh, so you can just select the uh, CSV file with uh, locations of the ground control points, and then you just tell the uh, the tool uh, what columns in the CSV file belong to which attributes. Uh, so altitude is the last one, and then click import. Uh, and then is it this uh, visual interface? We just need to mark every ground control point here uh, in at least three images. And at the bottom, uh, the tool shows you all the closest images to the ground control points. So you just easily switch between the images uh, and uh, place the marker in the right place. Uh, so when this is done and uh, all uh, four in this case GCPs are marked in at least three images each, uh, then this information is that uh, measured with accurate RTK GPS will be used for georeferencing the maps uh, and uh, the precision that you can achieve with, uh, with that is one to three centimeters uh, usually, uh, so the maps will, will overlay nicely. Uh, so that's something to consider if that's an important factor. Um, so once the imagery is in the system and processed, and the processing is usually pretty quick and uh, takes everything from a few minutes, if it's a smaller trial or if it's a larger one, it can take half an hour, hour, but usually you will get the results back in that uh, time frame. Uh, and this is what the results, uh, processed results look like. So Microsoft sensors have the visual bands, red, green, blue, uh, and uh, red edge and NIR 
So from visual bands, uh, so we will automatically assemble the uh, RGB or the mosaic, so you can visually inspect the map. Uh, but because there are multiple bands available, you can also choose what kind of band order and which bands you use for the rendering and visualization. So you can switch to the color infrared version, which can be useful in some situations, or you can even switch to the individual bands, for example, if you want to look into MAR band, uh, you can easily do that there. So let's switch back to the RGB version. And uh, as I mentioned also during this teaching process, um, uh, thanks to the photogrammetry technology, uh, we also create the, uh, the elevation map, um, <clears throat> which uh, in this case shows the differences in the elevation, but then in the, in the zonal statistics tools where we will extract the plot level data, uh, this information uh, will also be used to calculate the height of each plot. So every pixel behind the scenes here in the imagery contains information about the actual elevation. Um, so using that data, and I think Thomas will talk about that as well, uh, uh, it is possible to actually calculate the height and if the quality of this, this is why the overlap is so important, uh, because the quality of this elevation model will obviously affect the calculations of the height. Uh, another interesting visualization is, uh, so this is the Microsense Alton data set, so it features the thermal band uh, so in the plant health map, apart from the multiple vegetation indices that are available, it is also possible to render the thermal map that will clearly show the, the variations in the, uh, in the temperature. Uh, so this is the older version of the Altum, so it's not as high resolution, but in the new sensors, as we've heard, the resolution is higher and better. Um, so this is step number two, essentially, to process the data into maps. And once you now have the map over the whole uh, field trial, uh, the next step is to extract the boundaries of each plot so that uh, you can extract statistics not for the whole uh, field, but uh, on the plot level instead. Uh, and for that, uh, we have developed specifically for this purpose the tools for called trial plot tools. Uh, which provide with a few different ways of uh, uh, extracting the plot boundaries. Uh, and uh, uh, there are two different ways of doing that. So the first one is uh, the automatic plot detection, uh, where you would just uh, need to roughly outline the boundaries of the field, uh, just to remove all the possible outlines outside of outliers outside of the, the field trial. And then you just hit detect, and then in a matter of 20 to 30 seconds, depending on the size of the trial, uh, the boundaries will be extracted automatically. Um, so these plots actually have been extracted automatically, and you can see that uh, it can be pretty accurate. Uh, and the technology behind that is, uh, is the AI that we have trained specific model for detecting the gaps between the plots. And then once the AI generates the probability map of where the gaps are and the plots are, uh, we then reconstruct the, each plot individually uh, and generate the boundaries that way. Uh, here is another example of also a wheat trial uh, in the later growth stage where the gaps are very clear, uh, so the algorithms are able to pick them up uh, very accurately and uh, automatically uh, recreate the plot boundaries in a matter of, uh, of minutes uh, or seconds. <clears throat> uh, but this obviously doesn't always work, so Many field trials uh, are mapped during the very early growth stages when the plants just emerge. Uh, so then, um, uh, then the other option uh, can be more suitable, uh, and uh, that's the generate plot option here. Uh, and essentially, a lot of provides it with a with a template. Uh, so we have two plots here with already the dimension that I uh, specified, uh, and this is usually known uh, parameter, but uh, if you don't know the dimensions, you can just uh, click them here in the text field to match the imagery. Uh, so you'll want to uh, first make sure that the direction of the plots is uh, matches the direction of the trial, and then uh, <clears throat> and then just uh, match, match the height and the width and the gaps within the plots, and then from there you can just quickly generate uh, the plots for, for the whole field, uh, for, for the whole trial essentially. Uh, so uh, it's pretty straightforward and easy to do. Uh, so in this case, there were two rows and 42 columns. And then the next step, you just uh, provide the naming pattern. So it can be anything from, from the row and column indices, uh, or it can also be the snaking pattern. And you can choose from which corner of the tri uh, trial plot uh, you can uh, you start the naming and number of digits and so on. Uh, 
So that gives you really some flexibility to, to set the naming pattern exactly how you would like it. And then once the imagery is generated, uh, the last final step is to actually extract the statistics. And traditionally, you would need to use uh, uh, some sort of JS software to do the raster calculations between the different bands and different formulas. Uh, we have simplified that to essentially a single button click here. And uh, in the settings, you first uh, choose where, uh, which, which kind of metrics. Uh, so up here, uh, you want to calculate. So it can be average or median uh, index values, or it can be standard deviation, minimum, maximum, and so on. And then also which data set, data or layers to use for the calculations. So it can be uh, the reflectance values of the individual bands here, uh, or it can be a variety of different digitation indices or even thermal data. Um, so once that is selected, you just click calculate statistics, and then uh, in a few seconds, the statistics will, will be calculated. And then you can go plot, plot, uh, plot to plot and uh, see what the statistics are. Um, so here we see the statistics for NDVI index, for the uh, NDRE, uh, and then also different uh, other data layers. Uh, the plots also get classified, so you can quickly compare the performance of a specific uh, metric. So uh, they have different colors, and for that to become uh, more clear, we can uh, make uh, zones non-transparent. Uh, so then the red color indicates the plots with poor performance and uh, the dark green uh, the plots with, uh, with best performance. <clears throat> and uh, down here you can also select by which metric you want to classify all these plots. So in this case it's uh, average and DVI index value, uh, but really any statistics of what, what we selected there in the settings can be used. So it can be, for example, uh, average thermal uh, values, so the temperature of the plots, and then all these numbers are displayed here as well. Um, so I just want to show another example that uh, this can also be used in vegetable trials. Um, and um, what's really cool about this is that in this case, the customer first used the, uh, the plant counting tools where they uh, very accurately identified each individual plant in the imagery. So the circles here demonstrate where the algorithms found the plants. And then for each plant, uh, there are three different metrics that I calculated. So uh, the diameter in centimeters can be extracted from the plant level. Uh, and just show the variation between in the size uh, across the whole trial. Uh, but then also when the plots are generated with the general statistics tool, uh, you can then uh, calculate additional metrics for the plant count specifically. And that can be a number of plants, uh, or if, if you generated the sizes, like in this case, it can also be uh, the average diameter, which is really interesting to look into in this place. In this case, um, so this shows the, the variations in, in the average diameter uh, across the plots and also classifies them by different colors. Uh, so this is a really cool example how these two different tools uh, can be used together to generate even more uh, additional uh, metrics. Uh, and another uh, statistic that is really important in the early growth stages is the canopy cover. Uh, so using this uh, thresholding tool, we can tell uh, what are the soil pixels so that they get ignored during the calculations. And then everything above the thresholds will be uh, the vegetation and then canopy cover from that can be calculated. So the percentage of vegetation pixels uh, is calculated uh, for every single plot. And in the same way, uh, you can classify all these plots and see which, which plots are better and which plots have worse uh, canopy cover. Um, so, final example that I would like to, to show here is the, the, the new data set from the, uh, the MicroSense uh, Red HP uh, sensor, so the one that Emily showed here. Uh, so, it really provides great resolution, so 60 meters, you get 2 centimeters for pixels, which uh, enables this kind of application. So, the plant counting uh, tool can be used to adapt to these specific blueberry crops. Uh, and where you can see the, the resolution really make, uh, play an important role is where you have all the different types of vegetation in between the rows. So we have some, some sort of weeds here, uh, but because the resolution is sufficient and uh, you can see enough pattern to distinguish the, the plants from, from the weeds, uh, it really works really well to, to just uh, tell the algorithms, hey, uh, detect the plants, but not the weeds. Uh, and this is not a uh, trial field. It looks like a production field. Uh, so one interesting uh, part here is that zonal statistics can be really useful in, in production fields as well, where you can split the field in these multiple zones and generate uh, statistics like uh, number of plants in each plot or the plant density. 
uh, and then get a sense of the variations across the whole field. <clears throat> so the final part, uh, when, when you have all these stats and data, it's, it's really important, especially if you are working in a larger organization like, like Thomas, uh, you need to be able to share this data easily. Uh, and there are a few different ways so you can uh, generate the public web links so that other stakeholders can get access to the data through uh, to these interactive maps uh, just for the, accessing it through the web browser. Uh, or you can generate the PDF reports that can be easily sent to the, you know, through the email. Uh, or uh, the last option is the, if you really need access to the, to the raw data, uh, you can export all the statistics and metrics that were extracted uh, in a, into a spreadsheet or even a shapefile if you prefer to do further analysis uh, with JS software. Uh, so with that, I would like to stop and hand over the, uh, the virtual microphone to Thomas from, from the Danish uh, Research Institute, who has been our customer since 2018, I think, and uh, he will tell more about how they use multispectral imagery and analytics in, in their uh, field trial program. So, Thomas, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Igor. Uh, yes. Yeah, I, I would uh, like to tell a little bit about the background from uh, on DTI and SIGIS, and then on the Danish uh, National Field Trial Program and how we use uh, use uh, micro sensors, uh, micro -sense sensors and uh, and Solvi, and also a little bit about the outcome and benefits. I have uh, been working here in DTI since uh, 2016, uh, and my focus is on drones and sensor technology and agriculture robots and precision technologies. And I'm also uh, trying to coordinate this use of uh, drones in, uh, in the Danish National Field Trial. And it's me on the pictures there with the, a very old matrix at 210. Yes, biggest innovation is, uh, is a private uh, research and development organization. It's, uh, it's the leading agricultural knowledge and innovation center in Denmark, and it's, it's the owner of, of the concept Danish uh, National Field Trial, and also all the, the data from the National Field Trial. And it's my biggest uh, customer as well. DTI is, uh, I'm working in a, in a division called Agrotech. It's a non-profit uh, approved technological institute in, in the agriculture and food business. And we are handling and coordinates and development future methods and analysis on behalf of SIGIS in, in this uh, national field trials. And we also coordinate the drone flights and the flood cut analysis. Uh, yeah. We have uh, used drones in, in the field trials since uh, 18. And uh, and we have we started up with uh, with uh, I think uh, 50 or 100 flights and and now we are uh, eight research locations around Denmark uh, and 18 drone pilots. The national field trials is uh, uh, almost uh, 1,000 field trials per year. And, and you see the pictures here, it's, it's the location of all the field trials. Uh, and the hardware in DTI, we have a, a Inspire 2 uh, with uh, the Elton camera, and we have this old uh, Matrice 2 MFT uh, RTK with the MegaSense Red Edge. And the local, uh, my local colleagues are using. Uh, Phantom 4 or Inspire 2 or the Matrix 300 and uh, yeah, Elsom or, or the Red Edge camera. It's, uh, it's very important on the grand scale to, to have a lot of uh, training activities and education of, of the drone pilots and of course a lot of, lots of ongoing follow-ups on problem. If we see one problem in in one place, we, we have to tell all about it and learn from it. And of course, we have some guidelines and standards uh, described online. And this is, I'm sorry, it's in Danish, but it's 
it's from our, our guidelines and how to use Solvi and how to mark the the trial and the first plot. And yeah, each drone pilots are following the same standards for marking uh, calibration and altitude. We normally fly in 40 meters and with five meters per second. And, and of course, we're using the same camera type. So one trial in, in the North Jutland can be compared to a, to a trial in, in the South part of, of Denmark. This is uh, all the flights we've done last year, uh, 536. And you can see here on the left, all the types of crops we are using the flights for. And it's, uh, as you can see, the fertilization is, is, uh, is the most. And it's because of the, in Denmark, we are using uh, satellite pictures to variate fertilization and we have done a lot of work on how to do it uh, on the best matter and therefore a lot of the trials uh, are in fertilization. The workflow, when the pilots are done with the flight and everything is okay, they upload the pictures to Solvi and then uh, we have a, a shared account uh, so all of our pilots can, has as, uh, uh, we have the same uh, account so we can see all the flights and they mark the trial area and the first plot this is the trial area and down here we have the first plot so we know uh, where to start and now the trial is, is ready for the, the plot card analyze and yeah we are not using uh, uh, Igor's uh, Solvi product we started up uh, yeah, for like five years ago, and and we built our own uh, R script to uh, to annotate the field and and uh, and make the analysis. And it's 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 quite fast, but Igor's is. I think if we should uh, if we should start now, we would probably go with Igor's system, I guess. Uh, but one of the benefits we have is that when we have uh, uh, making all the plots, finding all the plots, uh, the data is automatically exported to the national ELA, the Nordic field trial system, it's called, it's a data system for all our field trials. And then uh, it's automatically calculated and public for all our, the field trial customers. And as Igor said, we are also making a trial note with a link to the public uh, drone picture in, in Solvi. And it's very useful for our customers to, uh, to, to see the drone pictures. They can scroll in and, and see all the details. And it's, it's really a, a nice thing to have. We use uh, the drone images for, of course, the biomass index, the NDRE and NDVR. And here you see the difference between the RGB and the, the NDVR. And as Igor said, we are using the, the elevation, the height model as well. For in that case here, it's for the lodging. Here it's spring barley plots. And we have uh, lodging here and no lodging in the other plots here. So it's it's really a, really a great tool for that. It's, and yeah, here it's the height model and it's very uh, accurate in, uh, in centimeter level. To do this kind of analysis, it's, it's important to have the ground level uh, besides the, the plots. So, so it's not always we can use that. Uh, the plant coverage, uh, we also often done that. This is a maize field, and here you see an example of two different kinds of varieties. And and it's very objective, as uh, Igor also said. The plant counts, this is an, an old picture, 
in potatoes, but we also use in plant counts in, in the, the plot card analysis. And we tried out to, to count the axis from the grain. And it's it's a little bit different, uh, difficult, but it's it's more objective than uh, than getting a, a, a field worker out and, and counting because they only want to count like hundreds and then they give up and go to the next plot. So it's it's uh, very useful as well. But I think it's flying in uh, in 20 meters to get the high resolution. So maybe we should try this uh, megasense uh, LTMP. We also use uh, drones in in uh, larger scale uh, trials. This is an uh, on-farm plus we call it for spot spraying. This is a maize field with uh, a lot of uh, very problematic uh, weed in, and we fly with the drone and and make a mark the area with the with the, this uh, weed problem, and then we. Uh, we set up the the field trial here for spot spraying and here for normal spray spraying and spot spraying and normal. And then uh, we could make this uh, spot spraying application for the sprayer. And the picture here is when when we are doing the spraying. The benefits for for the the drones here in, in the field trials. If you have like a lot of flights in the same uh, trial, you can uh, you can estimate the uh, growth curves for for the whole whole uh, growing uh, uh, time here. This is for when uh, the sowing and this is the harvesting. And we're doing that when we have like six or seven flights in in the same trial. And then we can estimate the whole curve and go down in any time of the, the, the growing season. Biomass uh, measurement uh, also, uh, yeah, we, of course, we normally harvest all of, all of uh, our field trials and we, we try to, uh, to see how good is the estimation of, of the harvest yield when we're just doing the flights. Here we have the, the harvest yield in hectokilos per hectare up here, and this is the NDI, and four different kinds of uh, flights in, in, in stages of the, I think this is winter wheat. And when we get to stage 49, it's, it's very uh, good uh, coalition to the to the harvest yield. So maybe in a few years we don't have to harvest all the field trials. It's very expensive to to harvest those kinds of uh, uh, field trials. Yeah, the drone also provide very visual security when we're auditing. All our, all of our trials are auditing uh, after harvest. This one is okay, this one is not okay. And, and when we have the drone flights, it's very useful in, in that way. And of course, if we have here in Denmark, some, some years we have very hard winters, not every year. And it's then a, a, a very good uh, method for, for seeing the, this uh, wintering and also the drought stress and yeah, some, that kind of measurements. Mm -hmm. I think that's it for me. Yes. All right. Thank you, Thomas. So we do have some time now uh, at the end here for some some Q and A. So feel free to enter in any questions that you have, and I'll be able to read those out and um, assign to the appropriate person. Uh, but I know I did have a question for you, Thomas. It was great to see the overview of both the analytics that you're currently using, you know, as well as what you're working on in future development, uh, what can be possible in the coming seasons, potentially, um, further use of this, this imagery. Um, but you touched on the beginning on the standardization of 
not only the equipment that's used across the different pilots, since it is a quite a large number of projects that you're you're flying, the scale you're looking at is pretty pretty large. Um, standardization with the equipment, um, but also with the best practices for data collection. Um, super important, and I know Igor touched on that as well, especially for the multispectral. There's a number of, of best practices to keep in mind there. What is the, I was wondering what the, the training looks like for those drone pilots that you do have in your network. Uh, the training is a one day course with the, and it's, it's really much about the white balancing and the calibration and how to avoid, uh, uh, yeah, avoid all the mistakes that it can uh, can uh, measure. And yeah, and then it's some practical uh, flying as well. So that's that's almost that. In field training component too. In, in field training, yes. Yes, and of course they all know a lot about the field trials and and all. So there, it's the persons that normally go to the field trials and do the measurements out there. So. Okay. So it's it's uh, yeah, avoid cloudy, uh, sunny days and and how to fly out of the area if if a cloud is coming and wait out there and you can fly in again and go further oh yeah pause so, pause mission so that you can yeah that makes sense. there's a lot right. of uh, there's a lot of tips and uh, and good ideas to be shared in this kind of business yeah so oh definitely it's, yeah it's all about so, and also how to use solvy and uh, yeah do things right so and the processing piece yeah, yeah. definitely there's a question as well as to whether or not the RTK is used or preference between the RTK versus using the, the ground co uh, control points. If you could speak to that as well, Thomas, in your experience, uh, what is typically used? Yeah. We're normally not using uh, other ground control points or RTK in, in field trials because we have the, the plots uh, identified by a, by a program. So it's hmm. it's not necessary for us to know if the exact uh, place. But of course, when we are doing spot spraying technology and we are using both RTK and ground control points to make sure that we spray on the on the right place. So mm -hmm. so we yep. are also using uh, EGOS uh, ground control points uh, set up and it. Works. In those scenarios. Yeah. Yeah, definitely makes sense. Um, and then a question about the uh, for Igor on the pan sharpening process. How does that uh, look like mm. in Solvi currently? What is that workflow? Right. Um, so it's essentially a fully transparent process. Um, like if you would process the imagery somehow otherwise you first stitch it into the maps and then use the panchromatic band to uh, to do the pen sharpening so you need to perform some some raster calculations in each band uh, so we have built that into our processing pipeline so that's that's done as a final step after the imagery is, is stitched the pen sharpening is being done automatically so you really need to don't need to think much about that you just upload the images and then in the end like an example that i showed there you get the pen sharpened imagery uh, ready to go and analyze perfect yeah i think it's a, you shared during the demonstration too it's there's a lot of uh, robust both processing and analytics that's happening in Solvi, but the interface is very simple to use which is nice um you're getting all those yeah. those benefits but it's just behind the scenes it's for the user, it's more of a kind of one-click kind of situation, which is really nice, easy to use. All exactly. right. <clears throat> Great, so I think that's it for questions for now. I really appreciate both of your time um, for, for joining us. Super helpful to go through all of this information to see, you know, from both the, the best practices for flying, for processing, as well as, 
you know, how the multispectral imagery is being used right now for it with the analytics and the outputs that you can get, what's being worked on in the future. It's super helpful, complete overview, I would say. Um, so thank you. Thank you for your time. Um, if there is any questions, feel any additional questions that come up afterwards, feel free to contact us um, at MicaSense and then I can refer you to Thomas and Igor um, depending on the question. Uh, and again, the recording of this webinar will be available on the MicaSense YouTube channel. It will also be sent out to all participants after, um, after this webinar is, is concluded. So thanks again uh, for everyone's time and uh, hope everyone enjoys the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.